Good afternoon and uh, welcome to the next Iberian Heritage Science and IRIS Heritage Science Academy series webinar. This is the sixth webinar of 2022. And I, my name is Matthias Sterlich and I'm professor of Heritage Science and Uni at University College London and of Analytical Chemistry at University of Ljubljana. Uh, this is a very special webinar indeed because of uh, the topic and of course because of our guest who is Professor Carla Balzoweit, who is currently an associate professor in the physics department of the Federal University of Minas Gerais in Belo Horizonte in, Be in Brazil. She works in solid state physics with an emphasis on electron microscopy, but she enjoys interdisciplinary collaboration and works with colleagues in physics, biology, chemistry, engineering, cultural heritage, of course, geology and forensic sciences. Today's topic is very, very interesting and extremely important specifically for research infrastructures, but also increasingly so for anyone working in particularly publicly funded research. The topic is fair data. Fair meaning, of course, find, fundable, findable, well, fundable as well, but findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable data. And this topic will be introduced by Professor Balzoweit, and the importance of working towards fair data will be discussed, especially so in heritage science. Because ours is such a broad and interdisciplinary field, it makes it a particular challenge to make data interoperable, particularly when using different characterization techniques for materials such as works of art, geological and archeological samples. There will be an opportunity to ask questions. Please use your Q&A option at the bottom of your screens and we will respond to the questions at the end of the webinar which is otherwise video recorded and will be made available via YouTube at a later date. Thank you very much, everyone, for joining. And uh, Dr. Balzoweit, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mattia, for the introduction. And I would like to thank also for the invitation. Uh, it has been a pleasure for me to start brushing with cultural heritage and uh, before i enter exactly the topic just uh, uh, see where i come from <laughs> that's a little spot here in the mountains and uh, via um, a national association which works on uh, science and technology of cultural heritage uh, we uh, it was possible for me and several colleagues to be part of the Iperion HS initiative. And uh, we are specifically more working with the DigiLab working group. And uh, so you see that there are many partners around it and it has been a joint project uh, of many, many people around. So, uh, I thank uh, everybody who has been uh, uh, working together on that journey, which is taking already uh, some years. So that's, uh, I want to thank every people around there. And Mattia, thank you very much for the HS Academy to show a little bit of that ongoing work. So uh, let's see where we, we end up. Well, um, the first thing is, uh, as uh, Professor Mattia already told, what is FAIR? So uh, F-A-I-R, and uh, that concept has been started or has started uh, around uh, in 2016 with an article by Wilkinson, Dumontier and Osberg. And uh, the idea is how to manage uh, scientific data, stewardship, uh, and so on. What's, how do we do that and why is that important? 
So the first uh, thing I want to do is just to, to check over the definitions. Uh, if you want to check on that article, it's I just grabbed some parts of it. Uh, and the idea of the fair principles is that as the amount of data, soon we will see why do we need data, is getting a little bit too large. So uh, how to manage that? And everyone who has an internet knows I want to find something. So I have huge amounts of information in any field around there. So how to find the information that I wish and uh, how does that impact in uh, the several fields of uh, study and um, more specifically what we are talking about is uh, cultural heritage but it's uh, just uh, permeates all sciences all fields of knowledge so and there are some interesting uh, ideas on several home pages you will find over there also if you want to check so what are each one of those or what's the definition of those in that first article of 2016? So uh, findable, so that we have an identifier for metadata. Data is described with which metadata? Metadata is clearly an uh, explicitly included in the identify that data describes. Metadata is registered or indexed, accessible. Uh, so that's, met oops, sorry, here we are. Uh, accessible, that metadata is retrievable by a protocols, a standardized. Metadata are accessible even when the data is no longer available. Interoperability, metadata is used as a formal, accessible, shared, applicable language for knowledge representation. Metadata use vocabularies that follow fair principles. Metadata qualified references to other metadata and reusable that I can use it and reuse all my data and they are associated with detailed provenance, meet domain relevant community standards and so on. So you see that every word of that definition says metadata. So we need to know what is a metadata first. And if we check, uh, on the internet again, but if we check on articles and uh, one of the sources is just Wikipedia, some of them are quite nice. And metadata is the definition of data about the data. What, what does that mean? So if I go uh, into, and here I have a small example and I have an image here. By the way, that's a micro electron transmission electron microscope image. So you see just the image and I have something over here that's a nice sample of uh, emerald and alexandrite and um, that we have been studying around here. And that's a diffraction pattern. So I will not explain that at the moment, but what is important, this software, and everybody uses a software nowadays to open anything, even an image or a article, a text, uh, data anyway. So every one of us is using a software for that. And if I check this, that is a software, a control that controls CCD cameras of our equipment. And so if I check here, at my image, where is it here at the moment? Oops, sorry, I lost that here. Display, display image info. So this here, I have a lot of informations 
on the microscope here on the session. Here you see I have a lot of things that are not written on. And on the image itself, when I get an image, that's a information of the data type. So I can see, which is easy nowadays, a concept that I have the size of that image in pixel, but I have the size in bytes, okay. But I have some other information around here. And then I also have information on calibration. And if I check here, I can see that I have information about the device so that I have a CCD camera and which is the name, which are parameters that I have around here. And if I have more on the CCD intensity and if I start opening up, so I have a lot of information of how that image was collected, which goes automatically to the CCD. So metadata of anything is how that data was retrieved in a certain way. And the interesting thing is that normally when I take a picture in my cell phone or in a camera, I don't even think about it. But that information of all the parameters that I'm gathering from that device where I'm taking the images is somehow or registered or not. And uh, it depends on my equipment. It depends on a very huge amount of factors. So metadata is exactly that idea. Oops. Let me cancel that, otherwise it won't let me uh, close that. And just by the way, that image was taken of that region here. So I can have information of information inside scientific equipment. So I have to think a little bit about what is going on there. So if I'm talking about metadata, it's that kind of information that I'm talking. But one of the problems is that I have a lot of different standards. What does that mean? For each type of image, of equipment, of uh, whatever I can think of, there are different ways of writing that information or there are different informations I'm gathering on it. So we have several initiatives of getting standards. So we have photo metadata, we have video metadata. And here there are some known uh, formats. If you save a, a video, for example, MPEG-4 is one of the known metadata. Uh, QuickTime is another one which goes more for uh, Apple devices. And then if you have a look at here, I have a lot of different things going around. So there is a need to be able to transfer that information uh, from one part or one equipment to be able to read that in another equipment. Because if I have an MPEG-4 video, for example, I want to open that in my computer, or I want to open that in my cell phone, or I want to open that into another computer. So those devices need to understand how to show that video. Otherwise, I will not be able to see it. And there is a starting of an initiative and there is a Dublin Core metadata, which uh, was discussed broadly 
into a community and you see that it has been a, a standard, a ISO standard since, well, something 2009. Normally, ISO standards uh, are being discussed around 10 years. So probably that discussion started in, uh, in 19, um, well, 10 years earlier, well, 1999, some around that. And here you have some very, very simple uh, topics that they uh, suggest that be used as a start of a metadata. So we will see a little bit more on that uh, in the next slide here. So uh, those uh, 15 uh, well, suggestions, they have a specification of what should be written on the file when I save it. And how to do that, it depends on who writes the software, who has the equipment and so on. So as you saw that on that image that I just showed before, there were a lot of uh, topics, but several of them were empty. So there are two things. I have the metadata, I have the suggestion, but I also have to be able to write that down. So why do I need that in cultural heritage? So as we know now what approximately metadata is and why do I want that in cultural heritage? So the first thing is that Cultural heritage is a very, very, very broad topic and very multidisciplinary, very interdisciplinary. I have a huge variety of different institutions uh, going from universities to large museums, tiny museums, public ministry, research laboratories, and so on. And I also have a lot of people involved with very different backgrounds. And all those people are talking about specific topics. And we need to understand each other. And not only the persons need to understand, but our equipment needs to understand each other. So if we go on a nice chart on cultural heritage here. Uh, that is one way of saying what is cultural heritage around and it's much, much more than that, but th that's a very a a short description. We will be talking when we talk about data a little bit more on that here. Of course, we have data on that part here also, but I'm working, we're talking a little bit more specifically about when we take information of those uh, objects here. I'm working more specifically on uh, tangible objects around. For example, I have an image, a photograph of a castle in Spoleto. And that was one of the, the trips that I was lucky to have with a colleague from Fine Arts. And here we have a wall. And here we have a painting here. And underneath, there is something different. So there are many, many questions that I have around uh, that I need information of that object. So, how to state what's the original, if I want to restore where, which data or when was that painted? If it's, do I need to clean? Do I need it to restore? Do I want to make it look old, new? There are many, 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 many questions which the community has to answer. 
But for answering those questions, I need information about that. And the other thing is, how do I get information? If I look, for example, at uh, a painting of Renoir. So he used a lot of paintings which were blues. And historians, we have interesting, uh, uh, information that it seems that Renoir changed his blue palette. And what does it mean that I use blue? So I look around and I go around watch what are blue colors around historically. And I can see that blues changed over the time. So I had Egyptian blue who got lost the recipe for a long time and it was found, well, I think last century. And I have different types of blues, for example, cerulean, which was invented or which was synthesized around 1860. And what are those pigments? If I look at those pigments, they are just like in uh, Egypt, calcium copper silicate. It was made of minerals which were available at that time. And here I have some of the first synthetic materials around. Nowadays, ultramarine is also synthetic. It's possible to make that painting in a lab. But if I go back, there are many, many paintings which have pigments, which were just made of a mineral uh, or uh, from trees or from uh, plants. And uh, that helps me to understand how uh, that painting or how that painter and, and the time he lived and how he was able to gather that painting. So there are many stories around that, that I, this kind of information can tell me. So that's the idea. And that is what has been happening in the, the last century in cultural heritage. Not only I look at a painting and I have a very nice historical perspective, but I'm able to understand what is that object made of and how can I relate that to the region and I can tell many many stories around that. So that analysis of a concrete object of a tangible object it tells many many stories on the artist on history but I also can understand how that painting or that sculpture or that building uh, survives or does not survive over the time. And that helps me also how to evaluate and how to be able to preserve that cultural object. But it also helps and authenticate and to have provenance studies. So that kind of information is very, very important. And, oops, what can I do around there? I said, I want to analyze that object. Okay. And then I'm taking a sample of that object. So that's a bust, just so I grabbed it in the internet uh, from uh, Rodin, Honoré de Balzac. And I have someone, I need a sample to understand that. But then I do not talk to that person or I don't even know that person. Some years later or in a different time, there goes another sample and another one and so on and so on and so on and i'm exaggerating of course so that if everyone needs to grab a sample of course the sample is very very tiny there nowadays there are many techniques that uh, 
are available also that I don't have to grab a sample, but still there are techniques that I need samples. And I would end up without my object at all. So I have a problem that samples are just unique because my work of art, I want to preserve it. I don't want to analyze it, take it apart completely. Sometimes the access is difficult. If I have, for example, a prehistorical painting on a cave and I cannot chip around in that cave and take samples, just, yeah, it's interesting. Or 10 years later, I have a better equipment. I want to take a sample again and so on. Sometimes they are lawfully protected so I cannot touch it. And sometimes I have the judicial disputes. So we don't have much room for mistakes. So sharing what we have and sharing that information that we have becomes more and more important if we want to preserve all those cultural heritage objects or tangible objects. And I think I'm going on the time so uh, I think I'll be a little bit faster otherwise uh, <laughs> I don't get into the the end of the story well the end not the middle of the story because the story does not end uh, so it's I'm talking about samples at the moment and uh, not only samples but uh, samples that originate and I get a a, a, a very a specific example, so I think that makes it easier for people to understand sometimes concepts that are around, but let's get some examples. So uh, normally I have um, something, I have a question, and I want that question to be answered and I'm taking a small sample, very, very small, and what I want to do and how I analyze that normally is how my sample is, what is the characteristic of it, and what is my question. But then I go, I have my object here, and I have my questions. So I can or I cannot take a sample. So it depends. There are techniques that I don't need to take a sample, but I interact with the object. And I will need to choose the characterization technique. And I will get some data and I will need to interpret that data. So we have hmm, a huge amount of different analysis possible. So imagine if I'm talking on cultural heritage with a very, very tiny museum and in the inner of something. We have uh, a lot of very small places uh, in uh, our state, which are mainly very small churches, which are being preserved by some local community. And with who or what, what can I talk around there? So that person needs some help, but I don't know even what, what to choose. So we need to be talking or have a chain of talk between different people. So that was just grabbed from the Iperion HS catalog. And just for you to have an idea, it's I have things huge, just our brand new series, a, a synchrotron light, and that's a characterization tool or I have from the NICE MOLAB initiatives, which are available in Iperion HS, which is a X-ray uh, fluorescence equipment, just measuring. So I have things that are huge, things that are very tiny. So what is adequate or what, how do I work with that whole amount of uh, techniques, ideas, and so on. Uh, okay, we want to have interoperability uh, solutions around, but I have 
two diverse options. So one of the ideas is just, well, we have to start somewhere. So let's just start and that's, well, okay, that's my field <laughs> of research or <laughs> I have been working with the electron microscopy for some years now. And that's a quite interesting technique. It's a scanning electron microscope. There are also transmission electron microscopes, but I'm talking about this uh, kind of equipment at the moment. But then I have very small ones, larger ones, bigger ones, and I can have different things around, different uh, information taken out of that microscope. And then we will focus on this kind of information, which gives me the chemical elements present on a sample here. And there I have a lot of possibilities, again, in the technique itself. So uh, a single spectra mapping and so on and so on. But I have something which is quite interesting, which is that I already have standards in place. So I have some uh, common languages in principle. And then I have something which is also more interesting. I have a metadata standard. And I have for single EDS spectra, which is already a ISO, uh, regulation and I have a proposal for larger data sets which are mapping also and that idea is just to extend so we are moving forward but to come back for the metadata so that is like the example I showed at the beginning of the uh, Dublin core metadata suggestions, which were just 15 topics. So here I have a suggestion of several topics around. And what can I do with that? Okay, I got my microscope. Here I got an image and I have a single point spectra around here. So I got some spectra which from which I showed the spectra here, but the metadata is like this here, which goes on and on and on because I am specifying what is the y axis and the x axis is 4095 channels around which have an intensity. And that is my treated data. What's the problem? This here, if I open the fi this file here, is just a text file, but I don't see anything similar to that. So what's the problem? I have from a different brand and a different software, this is one file, spectra file, that's another spectra file. So we have different brands on different equipments and I need to understand which every one of those are talking. So that's not an easy thing. I also have calibration issues. So that was before one of our spectrometers was calibrated. If you check the amounts or the uh, quantification here on that part here and the other one over here, you will see that they are quite different. It's because they are not calibrated. So here the spectra was taken at 10 kilovolts, at 30 kilovolts, that normal that at 10 kilovolts, I have light elements, uh, which I collect more uh, data and uh, not so much if I on a larger voltage. So I have technical implications or on the analysis that I need to understand what that is and how that works and if I'm correct or if I'm not correct. So we have 
different. We have an open metadata format. We have also HDF5, but EMSA is a little bit more, a little bit broader. But I also have a lot of proprietary format metadata, and they are all different. And I need them to talk to one or other, because if I get a Bruker spectrometer, and five years from now, uh, I want to analyze that data again, and I have to be able to get that data correctly. So uh, we have a problem over there, and we have to dig in a little bit more on that problem and how to make equipment talk to each other. <laughs> The same way that I talk Portuguese and I talk English and I can talk to people. So we need that equipment also have a common language around there. And for that, and I'm almost finishing Matthias so that uh, we can have time for questions and answers a little bit, that we are running uh, SEM EDS pilot and we have 16 different institutions interested, which are SEM EDS labs with different brands of equipment, different equipments. And we also have seven different institutions uh, which work on interoperability data management. That's mainly computer science people, because we need to understand each other. I might be a specialist in uh, SEM EDS, but I'm not a computer science specialist. Mm -hmm. And computer science specialists will help to organize that amount, huge amount of data and how to do that best. So we already started phase one, which is a single spectra data exchange. And we'll have a workshop at the end of 2022. So we probably at the end of this week, we'll know already the time. So I hope we are able to share that with the whole community. And then I would like to acknowledge, well, the list is huge, and uh, but especially Luigi Souza, which was the responsible person in fine arts for me to enter the fine arts uh, uh, community. And uh, Luca Pesati also, which uh, is uh, running the Iperion HS, or I don't know, manager, whatever. And Sorin Hermont, which is uh, uh, responsible for the G DigiLab. Yanis, which I have been working a little bit with him, also on some of the interoperability uh, and uh, fair data and whatever. And Vim which has been sharing already some nice data. So he's both a SEM, EDS SEM specialist and also a, well, a data management specialist. So that's, that's nice. And my institutions, well, where we are doing some our measurements of my university and of course the funding agencies. So I want to thank you all. I hope I did not talk too much. That's always a problem with interesting problems. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much, Carla. Uh, if you could just advance the slide so I can make two short announcements. Thank you. Um, as usual, we'd like to invite everyone to attend the next webinar, which is on September 13th at 3 p.m. Uh, Central European time or Rome time. And this will be a topic of interest to many of us, uh, which is climate change and cultural heritage. Of course, it's a huge topic and it is both a research challenge and of course, a policy and coordination challenge. And I'm certain that uh, Dr. Johanna Leisner who leads the European open method of coordination in this area will touch upon all of these topics. So please do join us in September at our seventh webinar. If I could uh, ask you to advance the slide again, um, I'd like to take the opportunity and also announce the, a new academy lecture series, 
that is organized by emerging professionals in heritage science or emerging professionals in heritage science. So this is um, in contrast to our webinar series, the lecture series is a highly structured series of topics that will be presented in slightly shorter format, but as lectures uh, for those entering the field of heritage science, but also for those who are interested in learning new topics, new skills, and um, specifically on various techniques, on various methods, various heritage typologies, and similar. Please follow the Iperion HS website for news and announcements regarding this new Academy Lecture Series. And may I thank the uh, Committee of Six uh, Emerging Professionals, Emerging Heritage Scientists, who have been busy organizing this new series in advance. Of course, uh, Dr. Balzovait, I'd like to thank you for this presentation today. It was uh, incredibly engaging, I feel, and uh, you opened um, a host of extremely important topics that we need to be thinking about. Uh, but before we start with the question and answer session, I'd also like to thank our colleagues in the central office who have made this Iperion HS Academy series possible. Thank you everyone for attending today.